good morning and welcome to Liberty Church Lark Lane this morning for our online gathering. So glad that we're all together this morning. Welcome if you're a visitor or a guest with us this morning. I don't know about you, but but these days are starting to, to almost blend into one, but it is a, a real joy and, and a really helpful marker in the week just to be able to head towards Sunday and intentionally set aside this time for 45 minutes an hour to to join together as God's people, as, as clunky and as funky as this might be, to intentionally come and quiet our hearts, to hear from his word, to pray together, to worship together, and by the help of his spirit, to be able to respond rightly to who he is. It, it's a good thing for us to do that. We're gonna hear from God's word now from Psalm chapter five. Mark and Julie are gonna read that for us. And, and as we hear this reading, we're gonna hear the, the, the characteristics of our God. We're gonna hear that he is a God of justice. Like that is a that is a part of God which which is really resonating with a lot of us at the moment, just in light of of what is going on with just our global uh, community of 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 humanity uh, at the moment. To hear that God is a God who loves justice, who pursues justice, who acts against the wicked and the unrighteous, is a good thing for us to hear. We're going to hear that that God loves the righteous, and he he. He encourages towards righteous living. We're going to hear more about that as we carry on our sermon series in the Sermon on the Mount later on. And we're going to hear, as we hear from Psalm 5, that God is a God of steadfast love. And a specific way that he loves us is by drawing us into who we are this morning, what we are this morning, God's people. He draws us into his presence, in the presence of God, but also in the presence of one another as well. The very thing that we are doing now, gathering like we are, is, is, is God's steadfast love being poured out on us. And I know that feels frustrating just, just doing it like this. And we long to be together physically. And, and that is right. But, but can we just, just see what God is doing in the moment here and how he is providing for us and still allowing us to gather as we are? What, what I want us to do on the back of this reading the reading will come up and we'll just spend just a few moments reading it through together. And then there's going to be some specific points for prayer that come up. And these points for prayer are, are centered on you, centered on me. They're, they're points for personal prayer. And we are going to pray that God would help us incline our hearts and have a posture of heart that is right this morning. To, to, to yes, have the frustration of wanting to gather together and, and this not being what, what we want it to be but to see this for what it is and to still desire that God would really speak to us this morning, that he would, he would work on our hearts, that he would, he would align our hearts to be more like, like his and that he would just remove the distractions of, of technology and being on our own or being with the kids running around, whatever it is this morning, that he would still do a work amongst us this morning. So let's hear from God's word. Let's spend the time on the back of this reading to really pray and to genuinely pray that God would do that work in our hearts as we prepare to hear from his word again, to worship in response and to live lives that are lives of, of goodness and righteousness that ultimately give glory to God. Psalm 5, give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray, O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice, in the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch, for you are not a God who delights in wickedness, evil may not dwell with you, the boastful shall not stand before your eyes, you hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful men. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down before your holy temple. In the fear of you, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness, because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me, for there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsel. 
because of the abundance of their transgressions. Cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them. That those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favour as with a shield. And so, Father, would you help us now? Help us to, to have a right posture of heart before you. Would you clear out those distractions? Would you allow us, uh, even just for the remainder of this time, this morning, just to focus intentionally on your son, Jesus? Jesus, would you help us in that? Would you, by your spirit, just remove those distractions? Help us for the next uh, 40, 45 minutes just to focus on you, to, to intently uh, ha have a desire to follow you, to listen to your words, which are, are always full of love and full of truth, to hear from you and to be ready to respond rightly to you. And so we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for one another, for the community of God's people and, and us being able to gather like this this morning. So help us now, we pray, in your name and for your glory alone. Amen. Our motives mean everything. If you've ever received a present, you know exactly what I mean. Hopefully all of us have at some point in our life and you know that the motive behind that person giving that present really matters. So this week it was Elizabeth uh, and my 
a wedding anniversary and I bought Elizabeth some flowers. And as I gave those flowers to her yesterday, she was really grateful. She was really happy. She was really pleased to receive those flowers. Now, now I know that she was, and I, and I think the, the reason that, that she was so happy was, was firstly, I, I got the flowers right. It's taken a, a process of trial and error over the last 11 years to work out what that means. But I think, at least I hope, I, I got the flowers right this time. But secondly, the reason that she's so grateful to receive them and so happy yesterday is because she knows the motive of my heart. She knows that I love her. She knows that in giving those flowers, I wasn't after anything else. I was just showing her my love. Now, in contrast to that, all of us, I'm sure, will have received a gift or, or been given something at some point in our life when we know there's an ulterior motive behind it when that person wants to get something back. Like I see this quite often with, with my kids, like they will give me something in order to get something out of me. And, and, and those two things are wholly contrasting. You see a motive of love and then a motive of wanting to get something in return. Now, the motives of our heart reveal the true nature of our heart and they reveal the authenticity of our relationships. And because we value relationships, we value the motives of that person. God is no different. God values relationships and by implication, he values and cares about the motives of our heart. In the passage this morning, we're going to see the first of, of three passages that address the, the three main acts of Jewish piety. So we're going to see this morning the giving of alms or the, the giving of gifts to the poor. And then we're going to go on in the next couple of weeks to look at prayer and fasting. And Jesus is going to encourage us to do those things, to be people who give, to be people who, who pray and fast. But there is a bigger picture that is going on here. Jesus is going to use these three passages as a, as a type of diagnostic to our hearts. Jesus wants to expose the real motives of our hearts and in doing so, he wants to reveal the authenticity of our relationship with God. So let's read the passage this morning. We're on page 811, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. This is Jesus speaking and this is what he says. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. This giving of alms given to the poor was a common practice amongst the religious folk in the first century. They would go to the temple, they would give an offering, and that offering would be distributed out to the poor. Now, before we go any further, I just want to say, God, God, God isn't con, uh, condoning us not giving to the poor. He isn't saying that, that we shouldn't be people who are generous in this passage. Like more than anyone, the citizens of God should be those who have a radical generosity, who, who give to the poor, who seek out those who are in need and give to them. But Jesus is saying in this passage that we need to beware. We need to be careful. There is a type of generosity that he is warning us away from. Like look down at verse one and look at that ver- first word in verse one, beware. And whenever Jesus says that, we should, we should sit up and we should take notice. Like he's just been through in chapter five, some some big areas, some big issues in life. But this is the first time that he's used such a direct warning. Jesus wants us to beware, and specifically in this passage, to beware of being generous just so other people can see. Now, we might think as we read that, what's so dangerous about that? Like what's, what's so necessary for such a stark warning from Jesus about us giving in a way that other people see what we're doing? Well, well, he builds on the picture, but he talks about just this illustration of, of religious folk going to give and having a trumpet, that's a trombone, isn't it? But a, a trumpet player going before them and, and making that sound. Now, if you ever heard a trumpet, my brother plays the trumpet and when he's practicing like you can't play the trumpet quietly like you've got to put your full lungs into that thing and you've got to blow hard and you can hear it like the whole of our house could hear it probably the whole of the street could hear it the the picture that Jesus is painting here is that is that this type of giving is a giving that is a display to draw the attention of others towards you 
The type of generosity that we want to avoid, Jesus is saying, is giving just to be seen by others. And he says, if that is what you're doing, then then you will receive your reward. Don't worry about that. Like you will receive your pat on the back. You will receive the applause of men and women. You will receive that that like or that retweet or, or whatever it is. You will get what you want, but you won't get anything more. But again, what's the danger? Well, Jesus has shown us that that kind of generosity, the kind of generosity that just seeks your glory and your fame, that type of generosity puts the true motive of your heart on display. And in verse 2, Jesus shows us the motive that is, the, that is put on display, the, the real nature of your heart that we see here is hypocrisy. That is what's revealed. Hypocrisy. Now, let's be clear what we mean when we say hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is not constantly failing to live out the life that this book encourages us towards. It is not, it is not walking in obedience to Jesus and stumbling and falling and failing and then coming back to, to him and confessing and repenting and trying again. That isn't hypocrisy. That is just the Christian life. Like even the Apostle Paul talks about this wrestle of, of doing what he does not want to do and not doing what he wants to do. The Christian life of what is one of trying to walk in obedience, stumbling and failing, but by the grace of God, being able to pick ourselves up and trying again. The word Jesus is used in here, that, that word hypocrite finds its root in Greek. In the Greek language, it is a, a word that is commonly used in the theater. And it is a word that is used for an actor who who wears a mask. They are portraying someone that isn't them. They put on this mask, they walk out onto the stage and all the eyes of the audience are drawn towards them. That's what a hypocrite is. It is someone who is portraying something or someone that they aren't. And in the context of this passage, what is it that the hypocrites are covering up? What is it that they're putting a mask over? It's their hearts. What's on the outside looks so good. What's on the outside looks so holy and so and so righteous, but Jesus knows. Jesus knows that they are just out for their own glory, which is not the way of the kingdom. And so the warning here is this, that there is a kind of generosity that just seeks out your own glory. And that kind of generosity puts the trueness of your heart on display. And what is seen is something that does not marry up with the changed hearts that you see in the life of the followers of Jesus. See, coming into the kingdom of God is not just about changing the way that we live. That is what happens. Like we, we are people who do good, who pursue righteousness. But that, that, that act of goodness, that act of righteousness flows from hearts that have been truly changed. These acts of righteousness flow from hearts that have been truly transformed, transformed by the love of God. What we see in the kingdom of God is true acts of righteousness that are motivated by a heartfelt love for God. Like Jesus wants us to be good people. He wants us to do good things. He wants us to give. He wants us to pray. He wants us to fast, but not unless it comes from a motive of love for God. You see this act of giving, it's the last in in a movement of, of a chain of responses that starts with our affections and then moves to our motives and then finally works itself out in our actions. And Jesus is clear in this passage that the example that he uses of of these religious people in their giving, it is clear that that what stirs their affections, this kind of first chain, this first point in the chain, what stirs their affections is is a love for themselves. And then that leads on to a motive, which is to receive praise and glory for themselves. And the result in action is then given publicly, sounding the trumpet so that everyone would give them what they want, praise and glory. But that isn't how it should be with us. Citizens of the kingdom of God should pursue generosity and pursue generosity that is motivated from the heart. And so let's have a look at those three things. Let's start with our affections. What stirs the affections of the Christian more than anything anything else is God. That is what God wants from us. God wants us to love him more than anything else. Now, if you're not a Christian, that might sound arrogant. It might sound egotistical, but it isn't. See, loving God is just a natural response to knowing God. And I don't mean knowing of God. I mean truly knowing God, knowing who he is, knowing what he has done. And when we know that, 
It is, it is just a natural reaction. It is normal for us to respond in love and to love him more than anything else. So, so when we know God, we know him to be a God who is perfect in every way. When we know God, we know that he is a God who before the foundations of the world has laid his claim on those that would be his. When, when we know God, we see a God, a father who loves his children in, in a way that we can't even describe in human terms. The only way that we can describe it is a, a love that stretches further than the heavens, that is deeper than the oceans. When we see God, we know that God is a God who loves us so much that he put forward his son. And we know when we see God that we see that, that, that Jesus, who is God, came. The Son of God, the perfect Son of God, lived a perfect life, lived amongst us, experienced all of the temptations that we would all experience yet without sin. And when we know God, we know that Jesus, who is God, walked towards the cross. And when we know God, we know that Jesus died on the cross, not, not for his sin, but for our sin. When we know God, we know that our sin crushed him. The weight of our sin bore down on him as the wrath of, of God was poured out on him. When we know God, we know that he has purchased for us forgiveness for every single one of our sins past present and future when we know God we know that he is a God full of mercy full of grace full of God when we know God we know that he is a God who raised his son from the dead three days later and as Jesus rose from the dead he pronounced victory over Satan sin and death when we know God we know God as we see the resurrection that he is more powerful than any other force or or spirit or or move in this world when we know God we know that he is a God who gives his spirit generously who lavishes his love on us who puts his spirit within us whose spirit dwells in us when we know God we know that he is a God who works within us, who strengthens us, who helps us in our weakness. We, when we know God, we know that he is a God who every day helps us in our weakness. When we know God, when we know God, and folks, I am just, just describing a few things that, that is just the tip of the iceberg. We know that, that God is a God who gives graciously. Like all of those things we receive by the grace of God, not because we have earned them, but because he loves us. When we know God, folks, when we truly know God, we can't help but love him. And so we let, let me ask you this morning, do you? Do you love him? Do you genuinely love God? And, and, and if you're a Christian here this morning, I know straight away your first response is, yeah, of course I do. Let me ask you a quick diagnostic question then. How would you finish this sentence? One thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after. How would you finish that sentence? One thing have I asked of the Lord that, that will I seek after? How would you finish that? How would you fill in the blank there? Ask that question honestly of yourself. What is it that you want of God more than anything else? What is it that, that you desire from God? What is it that you're seeking after more than anything else? Who is it? Or what is it that is supreme in your affections? Now for God to take that place, for God to be supreme in your affections is for you to live as God has created you to live. It is for you to flourish in the life that God wants you to live. It is for you to have perfect peace and perfect rest and perfect joy and to have those in all of their abundance and to have those for all eternity, not just in, in temporary measure like the things of this world will give you. For Jesus to be supreme in your affections is to have God in all of his fullness work in your life for his glory. If it's not God, if God isn't your answer to that question, I would ask you to ask him this morning to help you stir your affections for him. One way you do that is by going to his word, by, by just surrounding yourself in his gospel, remembering all that he has done for you. Submerging yourself in the truth of God, allowing your hearts to be stirred for him, and, and it's not strange for him to be utmost in your affections. It's not unnatural for, for him to be the one that you love more than anyone else. It's not selfish for you to love him more than anyone else. Because when we know him, that makes perfect sense. True acts of righteousness are motivated by a heartfelt love for God. And that starts with our affections and then it moves to our motives. If we love God, our motives will be driven by that love. Listen again to, to verse one of chapter six. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. 
You see the clear motive in, in what they are doing. What they are doing is, is they are doing these acts of righteousness in order that they would be seen. Their motive is to receive glory. Now we've seen this so much in culture, even in the last few weeks, we see this in our society, just as we wrestle with this issue of, of racial injustice, we've seen what, what, what we're now calling virtue signaling. Lots of companies and corporations being seen to say the right thing, to do the right thing, but, but really we know that their motives are just for themselves. Like they are just doing and positioning themselves in order to receive uh, praise and affirmation from other people. Honestly, one of the most powerful places that I've seen this, this kind of issue of motive play out is this. And you'll have seen this if you're on Facebook, maybe the Sweetie Challenge. If you haven't seen the Sweetie Challenge, can I, can I implore you, please, go on to Matt and Beth Kopphammer's Facebook and look up the boys doing the Sweetie Challenge. This is comedy gold. Like, you, honestly, you can't pay for this. It is so good. So, so the Sweetie Challenge is this. You set up, now this might sound a bit weird, but, it, but it's worth it for the laughs. You set up a hidden camera in, in the room and you put a, a nice bowl of sweets in front of your kids and then you leave them for a couple of minutes. So this sounds a little bit cruel, but they get the sweets at the end of it. Um, uh, you leave them the, this bowl of sweets and you say to them, mummy, daddy, just going out of the room for a couple of minutes. You can have all of those sweets if you don't touch them. Don't touch them while I'm out of the room. Uh, just be patient and, and I'm just going to do a few things and you can have them all when I get back. Now, you go out the room and, and what follows is just absolute gold. Honestly, go and have a look. So, so funny. Like you see a mix of reactions, but, but nine times out of 10, what you see is these kids being complicit. Like they sit there and, and everything within them wants to get those sweets, but they don't. They sit because they know they are going to get something out of it. And what we see there is a beautiful display of their motives being, being put on, on full display for all of us to see. They are just being good because they are going to be rewarded for it. They want to be seen to be good so that they would receive something from it. Now we can think about that and laugh about it, but, but you know exactly what I'm getting at here. We can all do good if we know that we're going to get something nice in return. Now contrast that to what Jesus says back in chapter 5 verse 16. He says this, let your light shine before others so that, here's the motive, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You see the difference between the two? So the first motive of the religious folk who are playing the trumpet as they, they go out, the first motive there is for self-glory. They want to be, they want to receive something as they do good works. The second motive, what we see in chapter five, the motive of those who follow Jesus is this, the glory of God. That is what motivates us. And the glory of God just means putting the character of God on display. If your affections are stirred for yourself more than they are for God, it makes perfect sense that your motives will be for yourself. But if your affections are stirred for God more than anyone else, it will make perfect sense that your motives will be for his glory. Our righteous acts should be visible, but should never be done for the sake of vis visibility. They should always be done for the glory of God. True acts of righteousness are motivated by a heartfelt love for God, which are motivated for his glory. So here's the third part in that movement. It's the action itself. So, so the affections of our heart define our motives, which then in turn affect the actions of our hands. Listen again to how Jesus describes how our acts of generosity should look in verse 4. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Jesus is saying our righteous acts should be hidden. And the question is, hidden from who? Should they be hidden from, from others? Should they be done in secret behind closed doors so no one else sees them? Well, some might interpret that way, but, but that isn't what he's saying. If we let scripture interpret scripture and look back at chapter five, we will see that actually Jesus doesn't want us to hide our acts of righteousness. He says we should live our good lives in front of other people. That is how they will see the character of God. They will see the glory of God as we do that. So who is it hidden from? It's hidden from ourselves. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. What is he saying there? What does that mean? Well, he's not saying that, that you just kind of live as if your, your hands have a life of their own and you've got no idea what's going on. What he's leading us towards is being generous in such a way where our focus is not on us giving, 
how do we do that? How do we how do we engage in generosity in such a way when we're when we're not focusing on what, what our left hand or right hand is doing? But we lift up our heads and we focus on something else. Let me kind of tell you this little story of, of Micah, my youngest, trying to learn how to ride a bike. He's been doing this over the last few months in lockdown. And, he, and he's had some, some good days and some not so good days. Now, in the early start of riding a bike, here's what would happen. He'd jump on his bike, he'd be pedaling, holding onto his handlebars. And as he's trying to, 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 to learn to ride, all he's looking at is his hands on his handlebars and his feet as they're, as they're pedaling away. And, and as he's looking at that, he falls over. Like, like the more he concentrates on trying to pedal hard by looking at his pedals and looking at his, his hands on, on the handlebars, he just keeps falling over. And here's the other thing that, that knocks him off course. Like if daddy's not there holding on to him, if daddy's not right next to him and he can see me, he falls off. Like he can, he can be, be taking his focus off the handlebars, but if he's, if he's not got daddy with him, he falls off and he loses it. Now there was one particular uh, event which was absolutely hilarious. Like we don't tell him that, but, but it was so funny. We were uh, learning to ride in, on Fullwood, Fullwood Park, a road near us which is fairly gentle in its gradient, but it goes downhill a little bit towards the end of the road. Now, Mike is going, he's, he's holding onto his handlebars again. He's still looking down, he's looking at his pedals and, and he starts to pick up a bit of speed and, and he's, he's getting that fast axis. he starts to outpace me and I start jogging behind and trying to keep up, but he gets to the point where he's going that fast, I can't even keep up with him. And, and then suddenly he gets away from me and he realizes that I'm not there. And he starts to panic and he starts to wobble a bit. And he's looking down at his pedals, looking down at his handlebars, and he's screaming out. And this goes on, honestly, for a good, it felt like about 10 minutes, maybe it was about 60 seconds. But he is flying towards the end of this road. There's trees and bollards and and a fence, and then a dual carriageway after that. He's flying towards it and he's crying out, Daddy, Daddy, come and get me. And I'm shouting, put your brakes on to him. And he's like, I can't, I can't. He can't figure out his brakes. He can't put his feet down. He can't do anything. He's screaming and crying. And the neighbors are coming out there looking. They, they don't know what to do. So I'm pelting, sprinting after him. And, and, and all he can think about is looking down at his hands, looking down at his feet. He's lost his focus. Now at the end of it, he just he, he managed to kind of uh, go into a bit of shrub and, and a bit of a tree at the end, and he fell off. And he was in bits, but but it was fine. He's 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 riding his bike confidently now. But here's what happened with Micah. He was so focused at, at looking down at his hands. He was so focused on his pedals. He wasn't looking ahead. He he didn't have me in his eyesight, and it all went to pieces. Now there's two things that had him fail there. He was looking down. And he had no one to look towards. But now when we go out for a ride, like I'm right next to him. Now when he looks ahead, he's so confident. He doesn't look at his hands on his handlebars. He's not looking at his pedals. He is looking ahead. His eyes are on the goal. What he's doing with his hands and his feet, does that matter? Well, yeah, of course it does. Otherwise he wouldn't get anywhere. anywhere. But that isn't his focus. His focus is on where he's heading. His focus at the moment is on me because I'm, I'm ahead of him. I'm walking ahead of him. And he sees who he is pedaling towards. Folks, when we give, when we are acting generously, when we are acting in ways of righteousness, we should be so fixated on Jesus that we hardly notice that we are given. We are not looking at our hands. We are not focused on the righteous act itself. We are not concerned if people know what we're doing, see what we're doing or not. We are focused on loving Jesus. Our eyes are fixed on him. We have lifted our heads and we are walking towards him. We are following him. We are pursuing him. We are walking after him. Remembering that the goal is not our giving. The goal is the glory of God. When we look at Jesus, our acts of generosity, folks, will just look ordinary and normal. True acts of righteousness are motivated by a heartfelt love for God. And, and we do that with our eyes fixed on Jesus. Now, as we wrap up, there is one last thing in the passage here that we must address. And it's the last thing that I didn't mention before, but it is in this sequence. So we see our affections then affecting our motives, which then affect what we do with our hands and how we act. But there is one last thing that Jesus addresses here, and it is this, the reward. Jesus says, if you want glory for yourself, blow your trumpet and you will get what you want. 
But he also says, if your acts of righteousness are motivated by a heartfelt love for God, you too will get a reward. Now, some of us might get a little bit nervous as we get here because we know that the Christian life is a life of faith alone. There is no works. It is by grace alone that, that, that we engage in this Christian life. And yes, that is right. But Jesus still says here that there is a reward for you. Now, we don't do it. We don't, we don't give generously. We don't, we don't act righteously to get the reward. But there is a reward. We read it here. And Jesus shows us what this reward is. This reward far outweighs anything that you might receive from from the praise, from the applause of others. And this reward isn't more money. It isn't better health. It isn't that you will live a happy life. Now we see back in chapter 5 verse 16 again what this reward is. And it's going to become so clear to us again in the next few weeks. The reward for our heartfelt acts of righteousness is this, that God is glorified. The reward for our heartfelt acts of righteousness is that God's character is put on display. And listen to me, if you feel shortchanged by that, if that was a bit of an anticlimax to you, then that right there is a diagnostic of your heart. That right there is showing you where your affections lie. If you think you deserve more than that, then you've missed the point. God is not shortchanging us here with rewarding us by him being glorified. That is not God shortchanging us. Like, listen, I love to reward my children. I love to give to them. I love to give them gifts. And as much as I can, I always give them the best gift that I can. And our Father does exactly the same for us. Our Father would never give us second best. And so that he is glorified when we live good lives is the best that he could give us. It is the best thing for us. The best thing that you can receive in your act of generosity is not that you receive fame. It is not that you receive f- uh, 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 praise. It is not that you receive glory yourself. It's that God's character, his love is shown to those around us. So folks, let us do good. Let us give generously. Let us help those in need. But from a heart that is full of love for God, with our eyes fixed on Jesus, And let us receive the reward with open hands, the best gift that he could give to us, more of himself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of love. We thank you that you continue to pour out your love to your people day after day. And we thank you that for those of us who know you, we know that to be true, that you are a God who is steadfast in his love. And we know that because of all that you have done and because of all that you are, that it is right for us to love you more than anything else. We also see that sometimes we struggle with that, that our affections are drawn towards ourselves. Our affections are drawn towards other things. And so, and so help us now, we pray. Help us to be people who would fix our eyes on Jesus. And as we see Jesus, we see the full character of God. And as we see the full character of God, help our hearts to be stirred for you. Fill our hearts with love. Would you be supreme in our affections? And Jesus, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for your perfect life. We thank you for your death on the cross. We thank you for your resurrection and your ascension. We thank you that we see all all the time from you just love being poured out towards us. Would that motivate us? Would our love for you be the motivation for us to live good lives? And as we seek good, Would you help us by your spirit, not to be fixated on the act itself, but to be fixated on you. Help us to fix our eyes on you. Help us to fix our eyes on the goal, which is the glory of God. We need your help, so we ask that you would give it. Holy Spirit, help us now as we respond. Help us to to respond rightly before you. Help us to, to see sin where it is present in our hearts. And I pray specifically for those who are yet to to see God as as their, their, their supreme love in their hearts. Would you help them now? Would you give them faith to believe that God is everything that he says that he is? And would you help them to place Jesus on the throne of their life and for them to love him more than anything else? 
Help us to respond rightly. Help us to, to seek to be people who would do good for the glory of God alone. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're going to spend some time in response now. And as we, as we pray, um, let us pray that God would help us truly to be those kind of people. That God would help us to live those kind of lives that, 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 that would truly reflect his goodness. Let us pray that he would stir our affections for him. The songs that we're going to sing are going to help us do that. They're going to help us see the love of God. And as you sing these songs, sing these songs in worship. Allow the, the truth of these words to really stay your hearts for who he is. Let us spend this time reflecting on the love of God. And if you, if you don't know him, ask him. Pray to God now and ask that he would stir your heart and stir your affections for him. And that you would see his love. And that you would not just know about him, but that you would truly know him and love him. So let's respond rightly before God now. Use this time to sing. Use this time to pray. Use this time to ask the Spirit to bring about change and transformation in your heart. Ultimately, not for our good, but for the glory of God.
darkness from this darkness you will lead us and forever we will sing you're the lord keep asking of God and asking him to do that work in our hearts to help us to keep uh, pursuing him and walking towards him and and living good lives amongst the people around us for his glory alone. We're just going to see a quick video now from Andy just about the kids resources that are available for us. We want our kids to be people who would live those lives of salt and light in the communities around them. We've got some great stuff available to help them do that. So Andy's going to share with us and then when Andy's done I'm going to close out our time together. Hey there Liberty Kids. We miss you all so much and we love you as a church. We love you all so, so much. And that is why we are putting together a bunch of videos for you every week so that you can study the word of God. So a wise man once told me that a Bible that is falling apart shows that that person's heart is not falling apart. Now mine is is getting there, I suppose, but I want it to be in even more tatters. Look at that, it's falling apart there. Guys, we want you to be so in love with God's word that you have a Bible that has fallen apart because your hearts are so closely entwined with God. So that's why we're sending these videos out. And this week, here's a little bit of what we're going to be looking at. So Gideon decides to test God. He lays out a fleece on the ground. He says to God, just to test that your words are true, Lord. I want in the morning for the fleece to be soaking wet and the grass to be bone dry. So Gideon goes to sleep at night and... When he wakes up in the morning, 
uh, he steps out of his tent, he touches the fleece, and the fleece is bone is soaking wet, and the grass is bone dry. He's like, this is amazing, God, but just, just to test one more time, just to test whether your words are true, whether I can trust you in battle, Lord. I want it to be the other way around, for the fleece to be bone dry and the grass to be soaking wet with dew. So Gideon goes to sleep, and he wakes up in the morning, and lo and behold, what has happened? The fleece, no dew on it whatsoever, and the grass is is soaking wet. And Gideon's like, I can trust you, God, now. Brilliant. Guys, hopefully you can watch the video, have a little look at it, and we will see you at some point. Love you, miss you, in a bit. Folks, these resources that we've got are, are really, really good. That clip at the end there is a brilliant video that we've got this week uh, talking about the story of Gideon, and, and it is hilarious, but it is also really, really good teaching for our kids. Please use those and really just work with your kids to help them get to grips with who God is and the transformation that he can bring in their lives as well. All of the kids' resources are available online at our website, www.libertychurchlocklane.com. Dot org. They're free for anyone to use. Remember straight after when we're finished in a moment, we've got our Zoom coffee room, just 30, 40 minutes for us to catch up, to pray, to ask questions of anything that we've heard this morning, to work through that together. We've got gospel communities in the week as well. Everyone's welcome to that. We've got the worship playlist as well. Please do put that on in the background. Just a few tracks that, that you can play to help you just respond to what we've heard in God's word today as well. They're available if you click on uh, the resources tab above there. That'll take you to a link on our website again where you can uh, get the YouTube, the Spotify or the Apple playlist there. Folks, if you've got any questions about anything that you've heard this morning, about anything to do with the, the Christian faith, if you've been with us for the last few weeks and months and you're you're really considering or, or you've got questions about, about the Christian faith, about Liberty Church, about baptism, covenant membership, whatever it might be, please drop us a line, info at libertychurchlarklane.org and we'd love to get back to you. Or you can fill out the connection card above, fill out your details and we'll get back to you as well. Folks, as I wrap up our time together, can we encourage one another to be resolved this week to love God more than anything else, to love God. And as we love God, to pursue righteousness, to pursue living good lives, lives of generosity to those around us. And as we do that, let us do that with a hope and a prayer that they would see your good works and that they would give glory to our Father who is in heaven. Folks, have a great week. Take care. Looking forward to seeing you in person. If we don't see you this week, have a great week, and we'll see you next week.